All right, good morning. Hello, everyone. We have a long talk with far too many slides. We kept adding them during the day, so we're going to get started. Uh, we hope to have lots of fun conversations. Uh, my name is Michael Windsor. Uh, I am the co founder of an Alpha Omega project, uh, and I've been working with Yarek on this particular project. Yarek? Jarek Potiuk, I'm an Apache Airflow PMC member and committer, also a member of the security committee of Apache Software Foundation. And that's why, that's how we started yeah. all the thing uh, with security. So we're going to start by talking about software supply chain risk, what it is, what it means, why it's important to Airflow. Uh, this is the obligatory XKCD reference. If you haven't seen this image, it's out there. Um, this is not hyperbole. This is actually what's happening every day in almost every software project out there. Uh, and I screwed up the formatting by leaving the Airflow logo in the wrong place. So how do we think about software supply chain risk? Well, there's really sort of two dimensions. On the risk side, we have things like vulnerabilities, tampering, and availability. And I'll explain that. And then the other side, you have all the aspects of how you change organizations to actually deal with those problems. So vulnerabilities are effectively weaknesses in the code, intrinsic, that were put there effectively by accident. Somebody left some code in there, didn't do some proper sanitization of something on a string, uh, and made the code vulnerable, attackable from the outside in some way. Tampering is when a bad actor finds a way to inject code into the final production environment, whether they do so at the source repo by skipping code reviews, or at the other end by modifying the binary when it gets released. Uh, these are pretty well understood problems. Availability is a less well understood problem. Uh, if you've ever heard of leftpad.js, uh, there was an issue a few years ago where somebody decided to take their toys, throw them out of the pram, and make leftpad unavailable and broke the entire internet. Because all of you continue to pull your dependencies at real time in your build systems, and you should be bad and stop doing that. Uh, but availability is more than just a package not being available, it's about the organization that produces that package having a sustained practice of availability, both from the point of fixing vulnerabilities, producing new versions, and keeping up to date. You know, there was a gentleman who asked a question about the Airflow project and its maturity. One of the signals of maturity of a project is that it has a strong foundation core, it has strong governance, it has strong security practices in place. So it's all very well to talk about these problems. The solutions invariably involve having to fix the culture of the organization to make it a priority, if people care about it, to know about it to change the processes that are used to build the software, to develop the code, and ultimately the technology solutions that make this scalable. So this is just one view into the space. I would encourage you to go look at the salsa threat model. This is really addressing some of the sort of build time threats uh, around where you can have changes coming in, attacks or weaknesses allowing somebody to tamper. So the salsa threat model in this case is very focused on the tampering problem. But as I mentioned, the vulnerability process and how you handle vulnerabilities is a big deal, and then the availability as well. So this is just one picture. So why is this a big deal now? All right, we've been in this software industry for 40 plus years, 60 for some. Um, why are we suddenly talking about software supply chain security? Well, if you think of your software house as sort of software product as a house, we've been locking the front door, preventing inbound network attacks better and better. We've been locking the back door with you know, uh, insider attacks or uh, phishing attacks and so forth by doing two-factor, all things like that. And now the water supply is turning out to be a bit of a problem, and it's very hard to stop using the water in your house. Everything we're using is now a good attack vector. And if you, you know, just look through the news, you see time after time, about every 18 months, there's a major industry-sweeping change. That's just the big news. It's bigger than that. Every day, lots of small attacks are happening undisclosed, undetected. So this is hard. Why is it hard? It's because it's an old problem. We've been doing it for a long time. We've been avoiding this problem. It's a technical debt that goes back 40 years. Uh, if you remember, those of you old enough to remember the Y2K excitement, right? This is bigger than that without the same clarity of the problem, the solution, or the time frame. So if you have a product and you are building software today, it is extremely likely that you are consuming a large amount of open source and therefore at risk. And Surprisingly, most organizations, not surprisingly, inevitably, treat their supply chain as if it came down from the sky on the backs of unicorns with rainbows everywhere on silver platters, and it's just fine, thank you very much. We'll focus on our own problems. And this is as true for 
the corporations that we complain about using our open source or are very happy when they're symbiotic helping on that, as it is for the open source projects themselves that treat their upstream supply, again, as if it came from unicorns. And so the choices you have, any organization, you should be looking at your software supply chain, have an inventory of it, and then for every single dependency, transitively, you need to decide what you're going to do about it. It needs help. And it either needs to be fixed, where you get engaged in that project. Maybe you even need to fork it and say, we're not going to keep using that. We're going to make our own copy and maintain our fixes downstream. Or maybe we should just stop using this product altogether. That seems like a harsh choice, but those are the realities. So the last F was some. There's one more F, which we don't mention in public. Um, but actually, there's another F, which is funding. And this is where my work has come in. Uh, in 2022, I helped found a project called Alpha Omega. Uh, and it was initially started by Microsoft and Google. And now uh, Amazon has joined the party as well. And we are uh, on a mission to essentially solve this problem at scale. And the Alpha and Omega speak to sort of Alpha is the focused efforts towards very catalytical, you know, industry changing in engagements. And the Omega deals with the hundreds or th hundreds of thousands of projects that need to have solutions where we can't just go in and fix them one by one. We're looking for scaled solutions and automation. Uh, our strategy involves essentially investments across four different categories, the most expensive of which, because of the sustainability problem, is providing staffing. So for example, uh, the Python Software Foundation now have two security engineers in residence. Uh, and we are staffing, we are paying for their salaries so that they can continue to drive a cultural change across all of Python and make tangible security improvements. We also look at the package repositories and ecosystems as being critical points of leverage. We've, we love that when we start with any particular project or open source organization, funding an audit teaches us a lot about that organization and its readiness to start going on a path of security because it exposes all kinds of questions, how they respond to those questions is itself a signal for us. And then finally, we are firmly grounded in the fact that we have no idea what we're doing. And we will continue to drive experiments and try new approaches to software supply chain security in order to meet our mission goals. Uh, just by the numbers, we've funded over 14 different organizations, about 8.3 million in grants, with more to come, 13 engineers, nine full-time security audit, major audits, but also uh, scaled audits done uh, in automated ways over thousands of projects. So all that's just an intro. I went as fast as I could to get to the meat of today's topic. Uh, and I want to talk about how the two of us came together and how this project came to be. And it actually started because of that uh, gentleman, Seth Larson, that we funded at the Python Software Foundation. And he and I have worked very well together. And we did a presentation at PyCon in Pittsburgh uh, early this year. Uh, and the little snake on the side of the image here is the Python security snake. Uh, there's a logo that Seth cooked up. It's awesome. And we talked about our journey in changing Python and how a relatively modest investment for Alpha Omega has had dramatic knock-on effects, not just within the Python Software Foundation, but across projects that use Python, and even better, across other languages and ecosystems that are following the Python example. Um, and this is how Yarek met. He came up to us after the talk, says, this is great. I want to talk more. You should do a talk at Airflow. I'm like, I'm not going to talk for the sake of talking. We've got to do something. And this is where one of the other themes of Omega has come along. So I mentioned earlier, we've been doing these sort of scaled, automatic sort of vulnerability discovery and remediation efforts. And we hired a company to go and do some work. And the first time they did the work, they came back and said, look at us. We scanned 3,000 projects. We found 300 vulnerabilities, and we fixed 10 of them, or whatever the numbers were. And I felt like I had just talked to somebody who'd rowed a boat out to the Pacific garbage patch and came back with several tons of plastic. It's great. Look at all that plastic you found. But the Pacific garbage patch is gigatons of plastic. I don't know how to talk about your work. How does this make a difference to anybody except to say, rah, rah, rah? And this led us to the notion of cleaning beaches. We wanted to be able to tell people that something actionable had been done, that something made their lives better. And metaphorically, we think of as a section of the beach where we can say this section of the beach is free of you know, broken glass, tin cans, uh, crabs, and jellyfish. It may not be secure past the edges of the beach, and there may be other things that we don't know. And we're probably not perfect, but we're trying to make it be a lower risk section of the beach so you can make certain assumptions. And that model 
led us to start talking about how we could collaborate with airflow. Because airflow itself represents a very interesting and well-defined section of the beach. It has, it's an application. It has relatively few dependents. It has a well-understood, thank you, Yarika and the PMC team overall, a uh, well-understood set of dependencies. And so we started thinking about this collaboration. And so from that, I'm going to hand off to Yarika, who's going to, of course, did all the actual work. I just showed up, talk about this stuff, uh, and now we're going to hear how it actually happened. Actually, actually, interactions with Michael and the Alpha Omega team and older people there is, is, is the best part of it because we, I've learned a lot and we've, uh, you've learned a lot. And so, so no, we are not doing nothing. It's a real yeah, partnership. Yeah. So that's what we are doing. We are do, uh, cleaning the beach. So let's talk about uh, Airflow security. I presented a teaser of this presentation at the last dev call uh, of Airflow last week or two weeks ago. And one of the questions asked by Vikram, Vikram is somewhere here, I guess, uh, was like, how, how can I tell that Airflow is secure? And actually, that made me think that it's, it's actually, I cannot tell that. Yeah? Because like, security is so vast, and you cannot, all, you cannot tell 100%, something is 100% secure. Um, but what we can tell, and this is actually provable, that Airflow is very active in its security. And this is something that we are doing for quite some time already. Uh, and that's much, more, let's say, it's much more than many other projects. And this is like, this also proves the maturity, maturity of, the, of, the, of Airflow as discussed in the previous uh, uh, panel. Uh, some stats on the how Airflow itself is active. So, you know, we have like 99 merged pull requests. It's just one week, yeah? 33 open pull requests. Uh, 58 authors pushed 76 commits. Like, Airflow itself is very active. Uh, we have 11,000 users, 12 almost, uh, just, just in GitHub, marked as we are users of Airflow, and more than 3,000 contributors. And this number is already much higher. You know, like we've merged, I remember I've merged quite a few commits last week with uh, a thank you for your first contribution uh, bot uh, writing about that. So we have quite a few more new contributors. But what is, uh, this graph is very interesting. You will, you will not see what's, uh, it's just too small. But this is a number of vulnerabilities uh, plotted against the releases of Airflow over time. And you see it goes down just as pretty much any other project because all the releases have older uh, vulnerabilities. But, but what you, when you look a little bit closer to that, so that's, that's fine. Like This is something that you would expect, that the vulnerabilities go down. But you look, something happened here yeah, in this place because you see the plot is going a little bit down, like. like Quite a, little, quite, quite a lot down in like the slope, like number of vulnerabilities handles between those releases. Uh, because if it, would, if it would continue going like it did before, we would be at like 20 something open vulnerabilities not handled yet at this stage. And that's the plot over time. It's around like, uh, this is like Airflow commits and Airflow releases. So it's around uh, to the beginning of 2023. What happened then? Actually, what happened then, we started the effort uh, of making a very active look at the, our, our security and redesigning our security team and making it much more efi efficient than it was. So we have a dedicated security team. We created and documented a very detailed process of how we are handling security fixes. We introduced a very precise security model so that we can communicate with our users and tell them, OK, this is what you expect from the security of that user or with uh, security researchers who report errors to, our, to us, we told them, okay, don't report this kind of security issues because they are not, they are part of the model. We added canned responses to issues that are raised to us so that we can much more quickly respond to uh, security research researchers without actually making them angry, <laughs> which is difficult sometimes if you have to say, no, this is not a security vulnerability, uh, and, and they, they complain, and we've worked out the communication with them. Uh, and also, what's more important, after analyzing the, the current security issues and, and, and addressing, addressing them, we disabled some inherently secure feature, insecure features, like test connection, for example, which, which it turned out it brings a ton of pro po possible security uh, problems, and we disabled it by default, and a few other things. Also, we hardened our CR, CR workflows, which is the, the part of what Michael said before, like that the whole security threat starts from the build, not from the release. Like, so our build also had to be much, uh, much more secured. Uh, and things that we introdu introduced as well, going into the salsa model or in the direction of it, uh, introduced like reproducible builds uh, that we know that 
release manager who released the, the package has done that without tampering with it. So like, you know, trust no one. Like, we don't trust ourselves. So we have now reproducible builds that we can check. This is, this is huge. Reproducible yeah. builds are the holy grail of software supply chain security and tampering because anybody can verify the build and produce the same results. I yeah. just gave a talk about this on the Java yeah. runtime side, so this is great. Yeah. So that, that's what we already have. So we know when we produce the builds that they were produced from our source code. We have like 15 people in the security team. Five of them are more or less active on that at any given time. Uh, Airflow have a little bit more numbers, 62 committers, 32 PMC members. We have 3,000 contributors. And thanks to that, we are big enough that we can attract funding and we can uh, actually pay for our security in some ways. So we have stakeholders like Google, Amazon, uh, Astronomer, and others who are actively funding some efforts which lead to the security, like my job, for example. Like I'm, I'm paid, fully paid uh, individual contributor. I'm, uh, Astronomer and Google are paying part of my time. And they are, I guess, happy that I'm working on security, I hope. Like, and, and it will be working in the future. <laughs> We're hearing happy from the studio. Yes, audience. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but also, we can attract funding like Sovereign, Sovereign Tech Fund. In 2023, we got uh, money from Sovereign Tech Fund from German government, which is an interesting one. Uh, for improving our security. That's how reproducible builds were bo born, for example. Like, and some of the maintainers of Airflow got paid for improving security. And now we have Alpha Omega Fund. Thank you, Michael, for that, which is funding the Airflow Beach Cleaning Project, which I'm talking about uh, next. But we also have our dependencies. And if you look there, so the Airflow is secure as a, like, is active in its security. I cannot tell Airflow is secure. Like you, you can never tell it as a security aware person. But if you look at our dependencies, we see we have a lot of them. This is like beginning and end of the dependency tree of Airflow. And if you look here, the number at the bottom is 579. This is like how, how big the tree is. And this is only the direct dependency tree without any providers, without anything. It's just standard dependency tree of Airflow itself. Like, like that's huge, a lot of them. That's a pretty big scale of things to be bringing into your software house and saying, you're fine. Yeah, you're fine. fine. 570 things that you brought and like, yeah, fine. Each of them has their own uh, security fi uh, uh, fixes. And those are the numbers that were produced by Open Refactory we work with. So we have the, the graphs showing the history of, of, of CVEs in some of the projects. This, this is just the selection. We have like a huge list and graph of those. But, but this is, this is a, a small sort of view into a very interesting part of what we've been doing this whole effort we've been doing is one of the first I've ever encountered, which is not trying to do an audit of all the code of all the dependencies, but to understand the security posture and health, organizational you know, governance and so forth of 700 plus dependencies. And just understanding their vulnerability process has really yeah, been a huge yeah. part. So Airflow security ecosystem consists of several entities. I'd say users. Who of you, and please raise hand, who is a user of Airflow, please? Uh, pretty much everyone here, yeah? But who of those users, and raise hand again, actually actively contributed to the security of Airflow? I, I gave money. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I see almost no hands. This is like, this is telling something. How many committers and PMC members we have here? Uh, quite a number, yes, yeah. Thank, thanks, you guys, like, you're fantastic. Uh, and how many of you contributed to security of Airflow? Mm. Quite a few. This is, this is actually pretty cool. But how many of you contributed to the dependencies of Airflow? Cheap. Security. Cheap. Cheap. The security of Cheap. dependencies of Airflow. Crickets. No, one. Oh, we had some? All right. One, one two, well, yeah. So, so we have a, a little bit of a problem because like Airflow itself, with the committers who are contributing to security, some of the users contributing to, to, to Airflow is, is fine, but we have no idea about our def, uh, dependencies. And the problem is that regulations are coming. We, Michael haven't talked about that yet, but there, you have a CRA, Cyber Resilience Act, in Europe, and similar acts in, in US and other places in China that will force everyone, uh, everyone, all the companies in the world who produce software, to take care about their security. And this is coming in less than two years. Financial penalties will be there. Criminal penalties will be there if you don't do that. So we have to be prepared. Everyone is impacted. And everyone needs to be involved. And later on, we have a, a, 
uh, birds of a feather, you can come to us and talk about that. We'll explain all the details of that with Michael. I'll, I'll tell a little bit more, more about that. So at this moment when we knew, OK, our dependencies, we have no idea what's going on there, experiment starts. And that's the experiment part, the deep right, exactly. part yep. of, of what happens uh, with, uh, with Alpha Omega. We decided to do this uh, experiment with Apache Software Foundation, Airflow PMC, Python Software Foundation, Alpha Omega Fund, some users indirectly because of this you know, funding of my work, for example, by, uh, by Google and, uh, and Astronomer. Uh, but also we have other external parties like Open Refactory, CDXGen, which helps us to automate uh, the analysis, OSTIF, security audits, maybe in the future, some external researchers, security specialists, which I'm talking to. And fun fact, when I announced the talk here, I got yesterday uh, one of the security researchers who re reported issues to Airflow before. Like, I w I'm, s I'm signing up. Just count me in. And I have a talk. Like, I, I go for holidays after this, after, after Airflow Summit. And we have a talk day after I come back from the holidays already set up so that he can join the efforts of, of fixing the That's security awesome. of our dependencies. That's, have, by the way, that's consistent with when we've seen this. When we start engaging with security, we have somebody whose job it is to care about security, and they start talking about it. It has a catalytic effect. It causes other organizations to get involved. Yeah. So this is a good thing. Yeah. So the goal is we want to review all our dependencies, all 700 plus, a lot. We are leading, learning, and adapting because, as Michael said, we have no idea what we are doing whatsoever. So we just want to learn. But we do not want to automate to scale but always remember about the people. And this is something that we've learned over the last few uh, months when well, we were working Every day. <laughs> every day that technology and solution like, you know, automation is like a, a it's not an end, end solution. You have people who are interac interacting with each other and this, those interactions are really important. And this is something that we are focusing on to make those interactions eff efficient with automation, but keep it there so that security people talk to each other, they understand and teach each other about security. And we want to teach everyone else how to do security and learn from them as well because it works, works in both directions. And this is, this is a chronic problem when we're dealing with that technical debt of security, which is when you show up at someone's doorstep saying, you have a vulnerability, I need you to fix it. You're writing checks on their bank account. Yeah. It's their time and energy and you are now forcing your priorities onto it. And then going back to those three Fs, you have to, you have to take that approach, recognize them as a human on the other end of it, yeah. and simply asking them or telling them to fix things. Uh, the log for, log for Shell example, there were all kinds of lawyer grams being sent to open source organizations as if they were commercial vendors. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And that th the third F, let's just remind, it was, it was not forego when I first, it, first it, heard. It, yes, we definitely from you. file check it. The third F is like, but, but we also, like, we want to, see by that, for example, like which of those dependencies are actually responding to our requests and, 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 and participating, because if, if they don't and they are insecure, we want to dump them. We want to for, forego, yes? That's forego, we'll go through. Forego. Fix uh, fork or forego. Forego, yes. Uh, so we already have an inventory and automation of uh, about 50% of our dependencies. This is like done by uh, Breeze. Our development environment is extended with, uh, with security as bomb features. We have automated scores calculating how good in certain areas those projects are and some additional explanation going what's going on with the project so that we can go and immediately tell, okay, this is wrong, this is, this is something you should, we should fix together with you, basically. And most importantly, the automation also produces the set of actions that we can do with those projects. And we have like 16 of them now selected uh, as a beginning to go and reach out, those who are most important. Uh, as we found by select, selecting some of the criteria we have. And one of the really great insights that came out of this assessment was there are things that are sort of context-free. They're just truth about the project itself, but there are things also that about, are about Airflow's relationship to that project yep. and how well you're able to talk to those individuals, how well you work with them. And if you have no relationship, your risk is very different than if you have an ongoing relationship. Yep. We also did a back analysis on all 790 pro projects. Uh, we took two months, 7,900 packages, 14 bugs were reported, high, medium, uh, low severity. And the fun fact, again, when they were reported, some people, uh, this is an automated report from Open Refactory. I don't know what to do with it. Like, it, they just didn't care. But then when I commented as a maintainer of Airflow, this is important to us. We, want, we work with Open Refactory, and this is something that we want to get fixed. The answer was immediate. I, either fixed, or we will fix it, or like. And 
yeah, your answer look like a human, not as a bot. So like probably, yeah, that, that's probably what you care. And, and that's what we've learned already, that this human in the loop is super important and, and making sure that we are, we are there. The experiment in progress, 16 projects we have to start with. Uh, those are actions that we can do with them. Security policy, adding security policies because projects uh, don't have often security policies. Follow up on non-secure workflows they have. Propose trusted publishing and implementation, which we, by the way, also will do very soon. We have plans for that and meeting on Friday to discuss this with uh, several people who will be involved. We follow up uh, and patch the vulnerabilities uh, with, uh, with, with projects and uh, propose mandatory code reviews where they are missing. But the long-term targets, we want to full test automation and coverage of, that, of our projects. We want to run some targeted audits for projects that will need them and will be, a, will be willing to participate and fix problems with the audits. We want to target all projects. We want to have regular incremental process so that when new dependencies appear, we will be able to flag them and, 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 and apply the same thing to all the new dependencies that we will have. And spread the methodology and findings that we have uh, so that we can contribute to other efforts like PSF, for example, this because is PSF is working on the whole ecosystem and we want to show how it can be done. And we're already talking about taking the playbooks that we've developed in this project here and generalizing them to apply them to not just Python, but other uh, software ecosystems and can conversations you, can, with Jenkins. Can you say about the other projects that you're working with? Jenkins? Or, yes. Uh, yeah, so we're, uh, another orchestration tool, this one is CICD one. Uh, obviously, you know, everybody knows about Jenkins. We've been talking to them about what we can do there. We'll see how it plays out, but this pattern is very interesting to us to reproduce uh, on a culture and organization and ecosystem basis. Yep. So what you can do, uh, I, because I think it's important to know that we, okay, we are doing that, uh, and we are telling our users, okay, you should contribute to our security. Often, like, we get a question from our users, okay, this is the list of CVEs, when they will be fixed, tell us now, ASAP, immediately. And always, usually the response is, please help us to assess those and let us know the actual reports which are showing the, how this particular vulnerability in our dependency affects us. So help us, because you are our users, we are free software that you get, we are a volunteer, mostly based organization, please contribute. But the problem is that uh, I couldn't tell that without a hypocrisy because we are the users of our dependencies. So we have 719 dependencies. And if that user ask, you, ask me, did you actually contribute to the security of those dependencies? Then my answer so far would be, well, no, not really. But now we will say, yes, we do. So you should also contribute to our uh, and their uh, security as well. We are already doing that, so look, there, there, there you go. So we will not stop telling, please contribute. We'll just continue telling, please contribute, because we already do as well. So contribute back security reports, and the important things, like they have to be actionable, they have to be show that there is actual security impact on, on the vulnerability, not just list of 100 possible issues that we will have to spend two days or two weeks to analyze. Yeah? So contribute, know your dependencies. Just do this kind of active uh, work on your own. You will have to do it anyway in two years, so better start now, because you will have to do it. Like, your companies will have to do it no matter what. This, this law is already passed. It just waits for, it to, to, for some standards to be developed. Uh, and support security efforts of similar in, in, in initiatives. Alpha Omega accepts grants, I think. Big, but, but big we'll, ones. We'll like take you, money. Yep. There are big ones, yeah? Like minimum is... Oh, it's right? complicated, but It's yeah. complicated, uh, it's complicated. So what are the learnings? And uh, maybe... Yeah, I'll take over from here. Uh, and we got the five-minute warning sign. I'm just laughing because <laughs> we're going to blow past that. Um, so I think probably the most important thing to walk away from, if you, t if you remember one thing from this talk, apart from the fact that Michael and Yarek are a hilariously com comedy duo, right, is that Airflow's ongoing security depends upon its community engagement with its supply chain. As is users and producers of software, if you're not aware of and engage with your supply chain, you are at risk. I should just stop now. But we'll take a few out to take away straight that. So it's a human problem, right? The software is just software, but the ultimate thing is that these dependency graphs, you don't have an organizational chart, you don't have a VP you can escalate to, you have to go and build trust across many organizations, some of which are giant things like Airflow, and some of which are mom and pop shops, like two people in a garage. It is a transitive problem, and the cost of adding a dependency is extremely high. New dependencies bring a whole 
iceberg under the water of new risk. There's an old Rob Pike saying, a little copying is better than a little dependency. That fork that I talked about, one of the three Fs, a downstream fork or a hard fork are sometimes a better solution in taking ownership of the code than depending upon some other organization. And it's much less interesting. C CISOs love to talk about zero vulnerabilities. I could care less about zero vulnerabilities. I care about sustained security handling over time because there's always more vulnerabilities to be found. And then obviously make it a priority. Uh, yeah, so that's me. Yep. So in October, there is a community of our code conference, uh, the Apache Software Foundation. We are under the umbrella the Apache, of the Apache Software Foundation, and they have the great security process that we build on. And we'll have a, 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 in Denver, Colorado, uh, 7th, 10th October 2024, there will be community of our code. I'll be doing the birds of a feather, security birds of a feather meeting there. And uh, uh, we are discussing a security work workshop that I will organize around the supply chain. And there will be many more projects, not only Airflow, which are under the ISF umbrella. So let's continue the conversation then if you are interested. And we're actually going to bring it on time. I know. You're, I had you going, though, didn't I, though? Exactly. So uh, thank you very much for your time.